When it comes to the past, we all have one simple question. What if? What if we pursued a love that has since been lost to time? What if we have been able to spend more time with our friends, family, and loved ones that have since passed on? What if we have pursued our dreams of becoming a big-time actor, a big-time musician, a talented sports star that could travel all over the world? What if we had decided to pursue our dreams of going to NASA and going into the depths of space? I have a what-if question on my mind. What if somebody had gone to the DreamWorks executives, Guy Pierce, Jeremy Irons, and anybody involved in this project and said, literally do anything else because, my fucking goodness, this movie, this movie, ooh. I'm John Ritten with the retro view of The Time Machine from 2002. Guy Pierce had been in Memento. We had Samantha Mumba, who was... At the time, a musician that had like one or maybe two hits, and Jeremy Irons was fresh off of being in Dungeons and Dragons and also Die Hard with a Vengeance a few years prior, and there was also some other good talent in this cast, and it's based on, wait for it, The Time Machine that came out in 1960 and also is based on the novel by H.G. Wells. This was also written by David Duncan, who wrote, <laughs> well, David Duncan wrote the earlier screenplay. Actually, John Logan had something to do with Gladiator, the Aviator, Any Given Sunday, Rango, Hugo, and a whole bunch of other stuff. And Guy Pierce, Guy Pierce, who was on the rise at this point, they thought this was a good goddamn idea. This is one of the most atrocious remakes that has been done in many, many years. There's simultaneously no life to it, yet they try to make it so goddamn epic. The special effects looked like shit even in 2002. And Jeremy Irons is touted as being, like, you know, a big part of this movie. He's in the last 20 minutes of it. It's actually fucking mind-blowing. Like, it's absolutely fucking insane. Also, Orlando Jones was in this, uh, fresh off of Evolution, and he was actually somebody I think that could have had a better, you know, Hollywood career as far as being, you know, the sidekick type and everything, because he was pretty funny. I mean, I know, I know he, I'm sure he still is, but it's just, it just seemed like he kind of tapered off shortly after this. But yeah, it's directed by Simon Wells. I assume no relation to H.G. Wells. Maybe. I don't really fucking know. He directed Prince of Egypt, Balto, Mars Needs Moms. He didn't direct anything between this and Mars Needs Moms, which probably means that he got fucking blamed for how atrocious this was. And granted, it does fall on the director and the writer for trying to make a movie good, but DreamWorks, if they didn't interfere with this, they must have just totally turned their brains off and said, yeah, that looks good. Okay, that doesn't look like it belongs in a 2002 movie or even a 1992 movie, everybody's sleepwalking through this goddamn thing. We're just taking the bare bones of H.G. Wells' concept and throwing them in, human centipeding them together with a whole bunch of futuristic bullshit and a whole bunch of, like, oh, we're just going to assume that everybody's going to believe that if we travel this far into the future, I have to stop you from saving my race in the future. I know you do, I know you do that. No, that totally screwed up that quote. But the whole point is... This is about time travel. It's about uh, Alexander Hardigan, uh, who's played by Guy Pierce. who, well, he has a love named Emma, played by Sienna Gilroy, who was Joe Valentine in the later uh, Resident Evil movies. And, well, one night, not in Bangkok, but in uh, London, or seemingly an outskirt of London, they just, they never really identify this stuff. They just assume that because it's a British city... Only a couple people, like, speak with accents, and then, like, so many other people just don't even fucking bother. <clears throat> um, Emma gets shot during a robbery attempt, and, well, um, let's just say Alexander's a little bit heartbroken, to say the least. So he spends the next four years coming up with all this stuff, hoarding himself in his house and everything, even though his, uh, housekeeper, Mrs. Watch It, do you get it? Do you fucking get it? Played by, uh, Philadelphia Law. She, uh, and I'm pretty certain I mispronounced that name, she is worried about him. His friend, uh, David Philby, who's played by Mark Addy, who's a terrific character actor and has been in a lot of good movies, and has done pretty goddamn well for himself. He's worried about him and everything, and then, uh, Alexander is able to travel back in time. to do 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 travel back in time to the day where Emma got shot. Okay, so he manages to get her away from the park where the robbery would have happened. And then he goes to get her flowers, because she promised him flowers, and he's all worried and everything, and everything's good. And a horse-drawn carriage runs over her. So instead of, and after talking to David, instead of maybe trying to go back and, oh, I don't know, going into the house and maybe hoping the roof doesn't collapse on him, nope, he just decides, hey, I'm just going to travel into the future. Why? Why not? Why not at that point? Guy Pierce is a terrific goddamn actor, and he seems to literally be sleepwalking through this goddamn thing. So he spent all this time building this machine. He builds his time machine, 
and he goes way into the future. I mean way into the future. To the advanced year of 2030. No, really, the advanced year of 2030. We're eight years away from 2030, and I very much doubt that any of this shit is going to be happening. I certainly doubt that they're going to uh, rely on Orlando Jones to sleepwalk through being an educational expert with, uh, you know, weird touchscreen, like almost a glass obelisk-like stuff, and that's really about it. That's really about it. He's uh, telling him about all this <clears throat> stuff going on. Well, you hear this uh, boisterous voiceover of uh, Lunar Leisure Living. They're going to basically a me megaton bomb the moon as a way to, like, you know, create housing and everything. Because that's what you want to fucking do with, uh, you know, something surrounding the planet. Let's blow it up. It's been perfectly fine not being fucked with. Let's go fuck with it. Well, yeah. Let's just say that doesn't necessarily work out after talking to Orlando uh, Jones for a bit. Well, actually, his name's Vox, because we're right in the box, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, he finds out about all this information, and he tasks him about time travel. He's like, oh, the science fiction, H.G. Wells, and all this stuff. But, or, you know, book by Alexander Hardigan. And it turns out that he lived till 1903. Apparently, he died. He died in some alternate timeline, somehow. He didn't know about it, but I guess maybe he was lost to time? Aha! Uh -huh. So, he's talking to him and everything, and he says, will there be anything else? No, I think I'll have better luck in a few hundred years. So, he ends up only traveling seven years into the future. The world be fucked, because they tried to mess with the moon, and, as previously mentioned, you don't mess with the fucking moon, and the moon is starting to fall down. Hey, that only, if only they did a movie called Moon... Oh, they're doing a movie called Moonfall in a little bit, which I actually will be watching. Yes, this is dating this review, but also it's a retro review. It's kind of dated already. Um... He ends up getting back in his time machine and everything, and gets, uh, it, there's this explosion that happens and knocks him out. Even though he's surrounded by a force field, it knocks him out, and he bumps his little thing, and he travels to the year 800,701, and he travels through ice ages and everything, and primitive stuff, and whatever, and it's, people, there's people called the Eloi, speaking an odd language and everything, headed by Samantha Mumba's character, Ma, uh, Mara. Whatever ha happened to Samantha Mumba, by the way, I do I do ask. Whatever happened to her? It seemed like she was in this, she did some music, and then just vanished. I mean, I hope she's doing well. But anyway, uh, she I mean, she was never going to be like the most amazing singer in the world, but she had enough catchy uh, songs. So, <laughs> um, didn't tell you, I think was the name? No, God, what, was, what the hell was the name of that song? It's in my head, but um, no one will love you if you don't love me, don't want to need you if you don't need me too, and didn't tell. Anyway, moving on from that. Um, the tribe speak in this language and everything. Mara is the only one that really can speak some English. Well, it turns out they all can speak some English. How can they speak English? Because this is actually New York and there's all these stone tablets with this writing and stuff like that from various landmarks all over the place. And it's not like that. Um, it's not like in Futurama where that supervillain got elected president and he stole all the world's monuments and put them on the beach. That was really funny. Truly a brave man. Look at him there. Woo! <laughs> so, he forms a bond with Mara. She has a son named Kalen. And they live in, um, they live in upside down straw hats hanging off of a cliff, and they live the primitive lifestyle, but the peaceful lifestyle. Oh, wait, no, they don't, because there's these characters called the Morlocks that are these weird hunty claymation, you know, things that have... Makeup, they could have not been comfortable, and the makeup barely moves. I think a mouth moves a little bit, and that's about it. <laughs> um, and there are these dreams that they all have about these weird skull, th you know, this weird skull cave entrance thing that literally is so stop motion that um, Ray Harryhausen would have spun in his grave. H.G. Wells should have come back from the grave, you know, like just come back and slapped everybody that was involved in trying to make this movie. And I'm not even talking about the cast. Just anybody at DreamWorks that thought this was a good goddamn idea. Um, why can't I change the past? And why would you want to? Oh, you lost somebody that you loved. Oh, yes, I did lose somebody I loved. How did you know? Because it's cliche. And we, we know about cliches in the year 800,000 to 701. So, <clears throat> there's no old people. Why are there no old people? The Morlocks come, eventually. Um, and gross, by the way. Terrible to think of the Morlocks coming, especially since Jeremy Irons, gross, is the um, leader of them. But anyway, 
What ends up happening is there's this prolonged, very prolonged action scene where the Eloy are being attacked and everything, da, 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 all that through the woods to <clears throat> over the hills to Grandma's house we go, except there's no old people. They shoot them with darts to knock them out and apparently put crude uh, 10W30 oil on them. And then they take them and they pull them through uh, holes in the uh, holes in the ground because apparently they're the uh, Morlock mole people. You got your mole people and my Batwoman. You got your Batwoman and my mole people. If you get that, I fucking love you guys. So it's so goddamn fucking ridiculous. They're moles on a mission, if you will. And um, this chase sequence, like, Guy Pierce was the main actor in this, but considering Jeremy Irons has a name, and, I mean, there are a couple other name actors on this, Guy Pierce is the main focus here, and he is just totally sleepwalking through this goddamn... I'm not saying that the guy didn't try to make these stunts work, but even he had to have known this movie was dog shit. <clears throat> he does eventually, you know, tell the people, we need to come back, we need to fight, you know, and everything. Well, then he goes to this weird area, or this one area, this cave, and it turns out that Vox somehow is still active. This technology is still alive and active in the year 802,701. So, uh, he says, ah, oh, it was one race, but now it's two. One above, one below. As above, so below. I retroviewed, I think I retroviewed that. If not, I will do it soon. <clears throat> um, can you imagine what it's like to literally know everything? I even remember you, because they interacted in the year 2030. There is no way we are going to have technology like that in 2030, considering people still can't drive on the goddamn roads correctly. So, one Eloy, uh, you know, guy escaped and actually told him about all this stuff and describing the cave, and, oh, you'll know, just follow the breathing. Okay, bit weird. And, you know, what are you going to do? It's like, it's like I'm going to go rescue them even and, and learn the truth, even if the truth is so horrible that it will haunt your dreams for all time. Well, I think I'm used to that. So, this is about 30 minutes uh, till the end of the movie. Alexander and Kalen go there, and he says, hey... Don't, uh, don't, don't come here because I don't want your mother to be worried. Well, Alexander says, I lost your pocket watch, but they took it. Why would they take my pocket watch? Hmm. So, um, he gets into the cave and it's a very, very long scaling down. There's bats for no reason. And they have their own machinery smelting. They smelt it and they dealt it. And Jeremy Irons shows up after... Well, Mara is captured, and after uh, Alexander gets captured, and basically tells him, I'm the leader, I control all of them here, and there are other pockets of us with various other leaders, and I control them. If I don't control them, and I don't control their thoughts, and your thoughts, and everybody else's thoughts, shit be whack. He didn't say it, but he might as well have. Jeremy Irons, at this point, I think they put more effort into his makeup than he put into his performance. And that's not knocking Jeremy Irons. But this is a far cry from even Die Hard with a Vengeance, Jeremy Irons, or Lion King, you know, voicing Scar. Um, and he's, like, you know, talking about all this, like, you know, Alexander's questioning, you know, why would you use the humans just for food? Who are you to question 800,000 years of evolution? Oh, I remember evolution. That's another one I should retroview. It was an interesting movie, if not weird. So, he shows him a life of what would happen with Emma and children that they would have. And he says that if this had happened, you would never invent your time machine. You wouldn't be here. So the whole reason as to why you're doing this is because you can't change the past, the what if, all that and everything. You have your answer. Now go. And he goes into his time machine. But then he brings, you know, uh, the Uber, Uber Morlock, easy for me to say, Jeremy Irons' character, in there. And they have the most convoluted fight. In a small, itty-bitty living space. It's ridiculous. And he somehow loses his uh, knife. He pushes him out of there. And he pushes the, you know, year forward, <laughs> like, way, way far. So he's all fried and everything and rotted eventually. Is the year 7... 746,538,921. There is no way this world or anything on it will be around at that point. There is no way anything will be around by even the year 2100. This world will be fucked even before I'm gone. Hopefully before, or hopefully after I'm gone. But, and it's really apocalyptic with skulls all over and everything. Oh no, there's more Morlocks because apparently they don't die. So he decides, he travels back in time to the year 800, uh, 2701. You following me? I'm not. <clears throat> and he blows up the machine by changing the future. Because he decides to blow up his machine because he could go back to his own time, but he wouldn't have his love. 
I guess because he's developed an attachment here, or because they can't afford to go back and shoot at the same locations. So, um, we get more, you know, people, we, we get more Morlocks running through, and they decide to fight a little bit, and then they're running through the tunnels, like, you know, Planet of the Apes style. <clears throat> and they get all vaporized, because the machine blows up. And everybody's happy, I guess. Vox is now still alive, by the way, as much as an AI program can be alive, and he decides to teach people and read stories and everything, and they're doing this, and it's a polite society, and Alexander basically tells of his place and what it was like while we see uh, Mrs. Watchit again. Do you get it? Do you get it? And uh, David talking about what happened, and David says, actually, I'm glad he's gone. Not that he didn't love him, not that he didn't appreciate him, but he said maybe he found a way to, you know, maybe he found a time where he was happy. And says, hey, Mrs. Watchit, why don't you come and be a uh, person, or why don't you come be the housekeeper at my place? Because I guess apparently the lease is going to be up on the goddamn house. And she says, Godspeed, my fine lad. And that's it. He throws the bowler hat off because that was a running gag where everybody was in bowler hats, but nobody's wearing hats now in the future in the year 800-2701. And they live and do whatever the fuck they do, and he's in the future and everything, and all this was just a convoluted bullshit mess that tried to be epic, was incredibly boring, and man, Guy Pierce should have been smarter than this. I'm not saying that he's the only actor to make really bad decisions as far as shit that he was in, but this movie sucked when I saw it in 2002, and I was working at the local theater in my town at the time and got into it for free, and I felt profoundly ripped off. I felt like I should have been paid to watch this. Anyway, that's really about it. Yeah, so it was a dog shit movie. Really dog shit. So let me know your thoughts in the comments. Like, share, subscribe, Twitter handle in the description. I'm John Rickland. I'll see you soon.